of Women by Jack London A wolfish head, wisp-eyed and frost-rimmed, thrust aside the tent flaps. Hi, Chook! Siwash! Chook, you limb of Satan! Chorused the protesting inmates. Bettles wrapped the dog sharply with a tin plate, and it withdrew hastily. Louis Savoy refastened the flaps, kicked the frying pan over against the bottom, and warmed his hands. It was very cold without. Forty-eight hours gone, the spirit thermometer had burst sixty-eight below, and since that time had grown steadily and bitterly colder. There was no telling when the snap would end, and it is poor policy, unless the gods will it, to venture far from the stove at such times, or to increase the quantity of cold atmosphere one must breathe. Men sometimes do it, and sometimes they chill their lungs. This leads up to a dry, hacking cough noticeably irritable when bacon is being fried. After that, summer along the spring or summer, a hole's burned in the frozen muck. Into this a man's carcass is dumped, covered over with moss, and left with the assurance that it will rise on the crack of doom, wholly and frigidly intact. For those of little faith skeptical of material integration on that faithful day, no fitter country than the Klondike can be recommended to die in. But it is not to be inferred from this that it is a fit country for living purposes. It was very cold without, but it was not over warm within. The only article which might be designated furniture was a stove, and for this the men were frank in displaying their preference. Upon half the floor pine boughs had been cast. Above this were spread the sleeping furs. Beneath lay the winter snowfall. The remainder of the floor was moccasin-packed snow, littered with pots and pans and the general impedimenta of an arctic camp. The stove was red and roaring hot, but only a bare three feet away lay a block of ice, sharp-edged as dry as when first quarried from the creek bottom. The pressure of the outside cold forced the inner heat upward. Just above the stove where the pipe penetrated the roof was a tiny circle of dry canvas. Next, with the pipe always at center, a center of steaming canvas. Next, a damp and moisture exuding ring. And finally, the rest of the tent, side walls and top, coated with a half inch of dry, white, crystal encrusted frost. Oh, oh, oh! A young fellow lying asleep in the furs, bearded and wan and weary, raised a moan of pain, and without waking increased the pitch and intensity of his anguish. His body half lifted from the blankets and quivered and shrank spasmodically as though drawing away from a bed of nettles. Roll him over, ordered Bettles. He's cramping. And thereat, with pitiless goodwill, he was pitched upon and rolled and thumped and pounded by half a dozen willing comrades. Damn the trail, he muttered softly as he threw off the robes and sat up. I've run across country, played quarter three seasons, hand running and hardened myself in all manner of ways and then I pilgrim it into this god-forsaken land and find myself an effeminate Athenian without the simplest rudiments of manhood. He hunched up to the fire and rolled a cigarette. Oh, I'm not whining. I can take my medicine all right. All right, but I'm just decently ashamed of myself. That's all. Here I am on top of a dirty thirty miles as knocked up and as stiff and sore as a pink tea degenerate after a thirty-mile walk on a country turnpike. Bah! Makes me sick. Got a match? Don't get the tantrums, youngster. Petals passed over the required fire stick and wax patriarchal. You got a low sum for the breaking in. Suffer and cracky. I don't recollect the first time I hit the trail. Stiff, I'd seen the time it'd take me ten minutes to get my mouth from the water hole and come to my feet. Every gin cracking and kicking. Fit to kill. Cramp. In such knots it'd take a camp half a day to untangle me. You're all right for a cub, any of you got the true spirit. Come this day year, you'll walk all us old bucks into the ground any time. And best in your favor, you hain't got that streak of fat in your makeup, which has sent many a husky man into the bosom of Abraham afore his right and proper time. Streak of fat? Yep, comes along a bulk. Taint the big men, as is best when it comes to the trail. Never heard of it. Never heard of it, eh? Well, it's dead straight, open and shut fat. Ain't no getting round. Bulk's all well enough for a mighty big effort. But don't stay in powers. 
It ain't worth a continental whoop. And staying powers in bulk ain't running, mates. Takes the small, wiry fellows when it comes to getting right down and hanging on like a lean-jowled dog to a bone. Well, hell's fire, the big men, they ain't in it. By God, broke in Louis Saroy. That is no what you call Josh. I know one man so very big like the buffalo. With him on the Sulphur Creek stampede, go one small man's. Lord McBain, you know that Lord McBain, that little Irisher with the red hair and the grin. And they walk and walk all the day long and all the night long. And big man's, he become very tired and lay down much in the snow. And little man's kick big man's, and him cry like, what you call, ah, uh, what you call the kid. And little man's kick and kick and kick, and by and by, long time, long way, kick big man's into my cabin. Three days for him crawl out of my blankets. Never I see big squall like him. No, never. Him have what you call the streak of fat. You bet. But there was Axel Gunderson, Prince spoke up. The great Scandinavian with the tragic events which shadowed his passing had made a deep mark on the mining engineer. He lies up there somewhere. He swept his hand in the vague direction of the mysterious east. Biggest man that ever turned his heels to salt water, or run a moose down with sheer grit, supplemented Bettles. But he's the proved the rule exception. Look at this woman Unga. Tip the scales at a hundred and ten, clean meat and nary an ounce to spare. She'd bank grit gains all there was in him, and see him and go him better if it was possible. Nothing over the earth or in it or under it she wouldn't have done. But she loved him, objected the engineer. Tain't that it. Look, you brothers, broke in Sitka Charlie from his seat on the grub box. Ye have spoken of the streak of fat that runs in the big man's muscles, of the grit of woman and the love, and ye have spoken fair. But I have in mind things which happened when the land was young and the fires of men a part of the stars. It was then I had concern with a big man and a streak of fat and a woman. And the woman was small, but her heart was greater than the beef heart of the man, and she had grit, and we traveled a weary trail, even to the salt water. And the cold was bitter, the snow deep, and the hunger great. And the woman's love was a mighty love, no more than man can say than this. He paused, and with a hatchet broke pieces of ice from the large trunk beside him. These he threw into the gold pan on the stove, where the drinking water thawed. The men drew up closer, and he of the cramps sought greater comfort, vainly for his stiffened body. Brothers, my blood is red with seawash, but my heart is white. To the faults of my fathers I owe the one, to the virtues of my friends the other. The great truth came to me when I was yet a boy. I learned that to your kind you was given to the earth, that the Siwash could not withstand you, and like the caribou and the bear must perish in the cold. So I came into the warm and sat among you by your fires, and behold, I became one of you. I have seen much in my time. I have known strange things in Buckdig on big trails with men of many breeds. And because of these things I measure deeds after your manner, and judge men and think thoughts. Wherefore, when I speak harshly of one of your own kind, I know you will not take it amiss. And when I speak high of the one of my father's people, you will not take it upon you to say, Sick at Charlie is a Siwash, and there is a crooked light in his eye and a small honor to his tongue. Is it not so? Deep down in the throat, the circle vouchsafed its assent. The woman was Pasuk. I got her in fair trade from her people, who were of the coast, that whose Tilkat totem stood at the head of the salt arm of the sea. My heart did not go out to the woman, nor did I take stock of her looks, for she scarce took her eyes from the ground, and she was timid and afraid, as girls will be when cast into a stranger's arms, whom they have never seen before. As I say, there was no place in my heart for her to creep, for I had a great journey in mind, and stood in need of one to feed my dogs and to lift the paddle with me through the long river days. One blanket would cover the twain, so I chose Pasuk. Have I not said I was servant to the government? If not, it is well that ye know. 
So I was taken on a warship, sleds and dogs and evaporated foods. And with me came Pasuk, and we went north to the winter ice cream of Bering Sea, where we were landed, myself and Pasuk and the dogs. I was also given monies of the government, for I was its servant, and the charts of man's which the eyes of men had never dwelt upon, and messages. These messages were sealed, and protected shrewdly from the weather, and I was to deliver them to the whale ships of the Arctic. Ice bound by the great Mackenzie, never was there so great a river, forgetting only our own Yukon, the mother of all rivers, all of which is neither here nor there, for my story deals not with the whale ships, nor the berg-bound winter I spent by the Mackenzie. Afterward in the spring, when the days lengthened and there was a crust on the snow, we came south, Pasuk and I, to the country of the Yukon, a weary journey, but the sun pointed out the way for our feet. It was naked land then, as I have said, and we worked up the current, the pole, and the paddle, till we came to Forty Mile. Good as it was to see the white faces of once again, so we put into the bank, and that winter was a hard winter. The darkness and the cold drew down upon us, and with them the famine. To each man the agent of the company gave forty pounds of flour and twenty of bacon, there were no beans, and the dogs howled always, and there were flat bellies and deep-lined faces, and strong men became weak, and weak men died. There was also much scurvy. Then we came together in the store one night, and the empty shelves made us feel our own emptiness the more. We talked low by the light of the fire, for the candles had been set aside for those who might yet gasp in the spring. Discussion was held, and it was said that the man must go forth to the salt water and to tell the world our misery. At this all eyes were turned to me, for it was understood that I was a great traveler. It was seven hundred miles, said I, to the Haynes Mission by the sea, and every inch of it snowshoe work. Give me the pick of your dogs and the best of your grub, and I will go, and with me shall go Pasuk. To this they were agreed, but there arose one, Long Jeff, a Yankee man, and a big-boned and big-muscled. Also his talk was big. He, too, was a mighty traveler, he said, born to the snowshoe and bred up in buffalo milk. He would go with me, and in case I fell by the trail, that he might carry the word on to the mission. I was young, and I knew not Yankee men. How was I to know that big talk beckoned the streak of fat, or that Yankee men who did great things kept their teeth together? So we took the pick of the dogs and the best of the grub and struck the trail. We three, Pasuk, Long Jeff, and I. Well, ye have broken virgin snow, labored at the gee pole, and not unused to the packed river jams. So I will talk little of toil, save that on some days we made ten miles, and on others thirty. But more often ten, and the best of grub was not good, while we went on stint from the start. Likewise the pick of the dogs was poor, and we were hard to keep them on their legs and at the White River our sleds became two sleds, and we had only come two hundred miles, but we lost nothing. The dogs that left the traces went into the bellies of those that remained. Not a greeting, not a curl of smoke, till we made Pelly. Here I had counted on the grub, and here I had counted on leaving Long Jeff, who was whining and trail sore, but the factor's lungs were wheezing, his eyes bright, his cachet nigh empty, and he showed us the empty cachet of the missionary, also his grave with the rocks piled high to keep off the dogs. There was a bunch of Indians there, but babies and old men were none, and it was clear that few would see the spring. So we pulled on, light-stomached and heavy-hearted, with half a thousand miles of snow and silence between us and Haynes' mission by the sea. The darkness was at its worst, and at midday the sun could not clear the skyline to the south. But the ice jams were smaller, the going better, so I pushed the dogs hard and traveled late and early. As I said, forty mile, every inch of it was snowshoe work, and the shoes made great sores on our feet, which cracked and scabbed but would not heal, and every day these sores grew more grievous, till in the morning, when we girded down the shoes, Long Jeff cried like a child. I put him at the fore of this light sled to break trail, but he slipped off the shoes for comfort. Because of this, the trail was not packed. His moccasins made great holes, and into these holes the dog followed. The bones of the dogs were ready to break through their hides, and this was not good for them. 
So I spoke hard words to the man, and he promised and broke his word. Then I beat him with a dog whip, and after that the dogs walled no more. He was a child, what of the pain and the streak of fat. But Pasuk, while the man lay by the fire and wept, she cooked, and in the morning helped lash the sleds, and in the evening to unlash them, and she saved the dogs. Ever was she the four, lifting the web shoes and making the way easy. Pasuk, how shall I say? I took it for granted that she should do these things, and thought no more about it, for my mind was busy with other matters, and besides, I was young in years and knew little of women. It was only on looking back that I came to understand. And the man became worthless, the dogs had little strength in them, but he stole rides on the sled when he lay behind. Pasuk said she would take the one sled, so the man had nothing to do. In the morning I gave him his fair share of grub and started him on the trail alone. Then the woman and I broke camp, packed the sleds, and harnessed the dogs. By midday, when the sun mocked us, we would overtake the man with tears frozen on his cheeks and pass him. In the night we made camp, set aside his fair share of grub and spread his furs. Also we made a big fire that he might see, and hours afterwards he would come limping in and eat his grub with moans and groans and sleep. He was not sick, this man. He was only trail-sore and tired and weak with hunger. But Pasuk and I were trail-sore and tired and weak with hunger, and we did all the work, and he did none. But he had the streak of fat, which our brother Bettles has spoken. Further, we gave the man always his fair share of grub. Then one day we met two ghosts journeying through the silence. There were a man and a boy, and they were white. The ice had opened on the lake of La Barge, and through it had gone their main outfit, one blanket each carried about his shoulders. At night they built the fire and crouched over it till morning. They had a little flour. This they stirred in warm water and drank. The man showed me eight cups of flour, all they had, and Pelly stricken with famine two hundred miles away. They said also that there was an Indian behind, that they had whacked fair, but he could not keep up. I did not believe that they had whacked fair, else would the Indian have kept up. But I could give them no grub. They strove to steal a dog, the fattest which was very thin. But I shoved my pistol in their faces and told them to be gone. And they went away, like drunken men, through the silence towards Pelly. I had these three dogs now in one sled, and the dogs were only bones and hair. When there is little wood and the fire burns low and the cabin grows cold, so with us, with little grub, the frostbite sharp, and our faces were black and frozen till our own mothers would not have known us, and our own feet were very sore. I sweated to keep down the cry when the pain of the snowshoes smote me. Pasuk never opened her lips, but stepped into the fore to break the way. The man howled. The thirty mile was swift and the current ate away at the ice from beneath, and there were many air holes and cracks in much open water. One day we came upon the man resting, for he had gone ahead, as was his wont in the morning. But between us was open water. This he had passed around by taking the rim of ice where it was too narrow for a sled. So we found an ice bridge. Pasuk weighed little and went first, with a long pole crosswise in her hands in chance she broke through. But she was light and her shoes large, and she passed over. Then she called the dogs, but they had neither poles nor shoes, and they broke through and were swept under the, by the water. I held tight to the sled from behind, and the traces broke, and the dog went on down under the ice. There was little meat to them, but I had counted on them for a week's grub, and they were gone. The next morning I divided all the grub, which was little, into three portions. And I told Long Jeff that he could keep up with us or not, as he saw fit. But we were all going to travel light and fast. But he raised his voice and cried over his sore feet and his troubles, and said harsh things against comradeship. Pasuk's feet were sore, and my feet were sore, aye, sore than his. We had worked with the dogs. Also we looked to see. Long Jeff swore he would die before he hit the trail again. So Pasuk took a fur robe and I cooking pot and an axe, and we made ready to go. But she looked on to the man's portion and said, It is wrong to waste good food on a baby. He is better dead. So I shook my head and said, No. 
That is a comrade, that a comrade once was a comrade always. Then she spoke of the men of the Forty Mile, that they were many men and good, and that they looked to me for the grub in the spring. But when I said no, she snatched a pistol from my belt, quick, and as our brother Bettles had spoken, long Jeff went to the bosom of Abraham before his time. I chided Pasuk for this, but she showed me no sorrow, nor was she sorrowful, and in my heart I knew she was right. Sitka Charlie paused and threw pieces of ice into the gold pan on the stove. The men were silent, and their backs chilled to the sobbing cries of the dogs, as they gave us tongue to their misery in the outer cold. And day by day we passed in the snow and the sleeping places of the two ghosts, Pasuk and I, and we knew we would be glad for such air we made salt water. Then we came to the Indian, like another ghost, with his face set toward Pelly. They had not whacked up fair, the man and the boy, he said, and he had no flour for three days. Each night he boiled pieces of his moccasins in a cup and ate them. He did not have much moccasins left, and he was a coast Indian, and he told us these things through Pasuk, who talked in his tongue. He was a stranger in the Yukon, and he knew not the way, but his face was set to Pelly. How far was it? Two sleeps? Ten? A hundred? He did not know, but he was going to Pelly. It was too far to turn back. He could only keep on. He did not ask for grub, for he could see we two were hard to put. Pasuk looked at the man, and at me as though she were of two minds, like a mother partridge whose young are in trouble. So I turned to her and said, This man has been dealt unfair. Shall I give him our grub a portion? I saw her eyes light as with quick pleasure, but she looked long at the man and at me, and her mouth drew close and hard, and she said, No, the salt water is afar off, and death lies in wait. Bitter is it that he take this stranger, a man, and let my man Charlie pass. So the man went away in the silence toward Pelly. That night she wept. Never had I seen her weep before, nor was it the smoke of the fire, for the wood was dry wood. So I marveled at her sorrow, and thought of her woman's heart had grown soft with the darkness of the trail and the pain. Life is a strange thing. Much have I thought on it, and pondered long, yet daily the strangeness of it grows not less, but more. Why this longing for life? It is a game which no man wins. To live is to toil hard and to suffer sore, till old age creeps heavily upon us and we throw down our hands in the cold ashes of the dead fires. It is hard to live. In pain the babe sucks his first breath, in pain the old man gasps his last, and all his days are full of trouble and sorrow, yet he goes down to the open arms of death, stumbling, falling with head turned backward, fighting to the last. And death is kind. It is only life and the things of life that hurt. Yet we love life and we hate death. It is very strange. We spoke little, Pasuk and I, in the days which came. In the night we lay in the snow like dead people, and in the morning we went on our way, walking like dead people, and all things were dead. There were no ptarmigans, no squirrels, no snowshoe rabbits, nothing. The river made no sound beneath its white robes. The sap was frozen in the forest, and it became cold as now, and in the night the stars drew near and large and leaped and danced. And in the day the sun-dogs mocked us until we saw many suns, and the air flashed and sparkled, and the snow was diamond dust, and there was no heat, no sound, only the bitter cold and the silence. As I say, we walked like dead people, as in a dream, and we kept no count of time. Only our faces were set to salt water, our souls strained for salt water, and our feet carried us towards salt water. We camped by the Takina, and knew it not. Our eyes looked upon the white horse, but we saw it not. Our feet trod the portage of the canyon, but they felt it not. We felt nothing, and we fell often by the way, but we fell always with our faces towards salt water. Our last grub went, and we had shared fare, Pasuk and I, but she fell more often, and at Caribou Crossing her strength left her. In the morning we lay beneath the one robe and did not take the trail. 
It was in my mind to stay there and meet death hand in hand with Pasuk, who had grown old and had learned the love of woman. Also, it was eighty miles to Hain's mission and the, to the great Chalkut. Far above the timberline reared a storm-swept head between, but Pasuk spoke to me low with my ear against her lips, that I might hear. And now, because she need not hear my anger, she spoke her heart and told me of her love and her many things at which I did not understand. And she said, You are my man, Charlie, and I have been a good woman to you. And in all the days I have made your fire and cooked your food and fed your dogs and lifted your paddle and brook and trail, I have not complained. Nor did I say that there was more warmth in the lodge of my father or that there was more grub on the chilcat. When you have spoken, I have listened. When you have ordered, I have obeyed. Is it not so, Charlie? And I said, Aye, it is so. And she said, When first you came to the silk cat, nor looked upon me, bought me as a man, buys a dog, and took me away, my heart was hard against you, and filled with bitterness and fear. But that was long ago, for you were kind to me, Charlie, as a good man is kind to his dog. Your heart was cold, and there was no room for me. But you dealt with me fair, and your ways were just, and I was with you when you did bold deeds and led great ventures. And I measured you against the men of other breeds, and I saw you stood among them in full honor, and your word was wise, your tongue was true, and I grew proud of you till it came to you filled my heart, and all my thought was of you. You were as a midsummer sun, when its golden trail runs in a circle and never leaves the sky. And whenever I wake, cast my eyes, I behold the sun. But your heart was ever cold, Charlie, and there was no room. And I said, It is so. It was cold, and there was no room. But that is past. Now my heart is like the snowfall in the spring, when the sun has come back. There is a great thaw, and a bending, a great sound of running waters, and a budding and sprouting of green things. And there is a drumming of partridges, and songs of robins, and great music. For the winter's broken, Pasuk and I have learned the love of a woman. She smiled and moved for me to draw closer, and she said, I am glad. After that she lay quiet for a long time, breathing softly, her head upon my breast. Then she whispered, The trail ends here, and I am tired. But first I would speak of other things. In the long ago, when I was a girl in the Chilcat, I played alone among the skin bales of my father's lodge, for the men were away on the hunt and the women and the boys were dragging in the meat. It was in the spring, and I was alone. A great brown bear, just awake from his winter's sleep, hungry, his fur came to the bones, his flaps of leanness, shoved his head within the lodge, and said, Woof! My brother came running back with the first sled of meat, and he fought off the bear with burning sticks from the fire, and the dogs in their harnesses, with the sled behind them, fell upon the bear. There was a great battle and much noise. They rolled in the fire, the skin bales were scattered, the lodge overthrown. But in the end the bear lay dead, with the fingers of my brother in his mouth and the marks of his claws upon my brother's face. Did you mark the Indian by the Pelly Trail, his mitten which had no thumb, his hand which he warned by our fire? He was my brother, and he said he should have no grub, and he went away in silence without grub. This, my brothers, was the love of Pasuk, who died in the snow by the caribou crossing. It was a mighty love, for she denied her brother for the man who led her away on weary trails to a bitter end. And further, such was this woman's love, she denied herself. Ere she closed her eyes for the last time, she took my hand and slipped it under her squirrel-skin parka to her waist. I felt there was a well-filled pouch, and learned of the secret of her lost strength. Day by day we had shared fare to the last least bit, and day by day but her half share which she had eaten. The other half had gone into the well-filled pouch. And she said, This is the end of the trail for Pasuk, but your trail, Charlie, leads on and on, over the great Chalkut, down the Haines Mission and to the sea. And it leads on and on by the light of many suns, over unknown lands into the strange waters, and it is full of years and honors and great glories. It leads you to the lodges of many women, and good women, but it will never lead you to a greater love than the love of Pasuk. And I knew the woman spoke true, but the madness came upon me, 
and I threw the well-filled pouch from me, and swore that my trail had reached an end, till her tired eyes grew soft with tears, and she said, Among men has Sitka Charlie walked in honor, and ever has his word been true. Does he forget that honor now, and talk vain words by the caribou crossing? Does he remember no more the men of Forty Mile, who gave him of their grub to the best of their dogs, the pick? Ever has Pasuk been proud of her man, let him lift himself up, gird on his snowshoes, and be gone, that she may still keep her pride. And when she grew cold in my arms, I arose and sought out the well-filled pouch, and girt on my snowshoes, and staggered along the trail, for there was a weakness in my knees, and my head was dizzy, and in my ears was a roaring, and a flashing of fire upon my eyes. Forgotten trails of boyhood came back to me. I sat by the full pots of the potlash feast, and raised my voice in song, and danced to the chanting of the firemen, and maidens, and the booming of the walrus drums, and Pasuk held my hand and walked by my side. When I lay down to sleep, she waked me. When I stumbled and fell, she raised me. When I wandered in the deep snow, she led me back to the trail. And in this wise, like a man be fit of reason, who sees strange visions, and whose thoughts are light with wine, I came to Haines' mission by the sea. Sitka Charlie threw back the tent flaps. It was midday, to the south, just clearing the bleak Henderson divide, poised the cold disk sun. On either hand the sun-dogs blaze. The air was a gossamer of glittering frost. In the foreground, beside the trail, a wolf-dog bristling with frost thrust a long snout heavenward and mourned. Mm -hmm. 